Welcome to The Meaning of Catholic. This is Timothy Flanders. I'm joined today by Dr. Henry Abramson. Dr. Abramson, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you. Nice to speak with you. Excellent. Well, looking forward to talking with you. Henry Abramson received a bachelor's degree in philosophy and his PhD in history from the University of Toronto, with some of his coursework completed at the Pontifical Institute of Medieval Studies and St. Michael's College. He also holds a diploma from Kiev State University in Ukraine and has held various postdoctoral and visiting positions at Cornell, Harvard, Oxford, and the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. He currently serves as a Dean of Turo College in Brooklyn, New York. He is a specialist in Jewish history and thought and published numerous books and articles on a wide range of topics, including a translation and commentary of Maimonides, writings on repentance, reading the Talmud, the Sea of Talmud, the Kabbalah of Forgiveness, on the writings of Rabbi Moshe Cordovera, and forthcoming three-volume history of the Jewish people, as well as academic articles in English, German, and Hebrew. He is also the author of a popular daily podcast on the Talmud, sponsored by the Orthodox Union. So, Dr. Abramson, it is really an honor to have you on the show. Thank you so much for your time today. Oh, it's my privilege. Thank you for inviting me. Excellent. So viewers can view Dr. Abramson's YouTube channel as well. There's a link below to his work and his website. To, there's a, he has numerous free lectures on many topics of great interest uh, to Jews and Catholics and uh, a lot of great information. So thank you for sharing. The topic we're going to be discussing today is the Jewish tradition and logos or Hellenism. And we're defining logos in a very general sense as generally the Hellenistic, realistic, philosophical tradition. Viewers of mine will be familiar with this period that we're going to discuss, which is essentially the second temple period and beyond, which is the formative period of both Judaism and Christianity. Judaism understood after Christianity, of course. Um, and so it's a very a topic uh, and a period of great interest. Um, and uh, but before we get into more of the topic, I wanted to just ask you about your current work. You're currently working on a three volume history. Can you tell us about that work? Um, sure. Thank you. <clears throat> well, um, you know, one of the nature, one of the aspects of the historical profession is since uh, World War II in particular and the rise of postmodernism has been a tendency to really, really specialize and really focus on narrow, narrow elements uh, or periods of Jewish history. And uh, I've always, you know, really admired the great encyclopedic historians of uh, Heinrich Kretz and uh, Shimon Dubno, Sala Wittmeyer Baron, who had like these massive expansive views of Jewish history. So I'm kind of going retro and I'm going to produce a survey history that will not nearly be as detailed or as erudite as uh, either the specialized studies or even those great encyclopedic historians, but it's a basically a soup to nuts history of the Jewish people from the earliest time we kept track of them until the present day and uh, trying to take a global approach as well, looking at some of the more exotic Jewish communities in China and Africa and, and India, places like that as well. Well, that's very fascinating. Yeah, I, I, I also have a similar interest in more the survey history kind of bringing it together there's certainly a, a strong depth and there's a great um uh, great good that can come from that but i like what you're doing i look forward to your work um so let's start off talking about the second temple period uh which is uh, which is in in the uh book of ezra and nehemiah you can read about this which is when the books the jews come back from exile and they begin they reinstitute the sacrifice of aaron and then they begin to start the temple. And this is the period where the different parties of Judaism arise. And so it seems to me uh, that the central question is the authority of the oral tradition. And it's already in the book of Ezra. I believe it's Ezra and Nehemiah. There is a, there's a scene where the priests are teaching all the people and interpreting the Torah to them. So is it clear? Do you see that as the evidence of the, is that the, is that the oral Torah coming out at that point? That's uh, an excellent question. And by the way, just to be fair to your audience, uh, I thank you very much for sending your questions in advance. Uh, a lot of them were really hard questions, and I have a rule, no hard questions, please. <laughs> but uh, the... Um, 
that I would, you phrased it a little differently just speaking to me now than you did in written form. And I think the written form was a little more precise. And if I remember correctly, what you asked then was the principal question was, who has the authority to, to, to determine the authentic oral tradition? Yes. And that's, I think, right on in many ways. I've never actually thought of it precisely in the terms that you've laid it out. It's a very helpful thought. Um, uh, it, it, the, the question as to when that question first arose, I think you would go back even further. You can see that, for example, in Korach's rebellion in the book of Numbers, the question mm. of who has the right to determine how we are to explore and regulate the gray areas of the commandments laid out in the Torah. And that's really the, the central question, perhaps maybe the number two question, the first question, the hardest question, which you didn't put on your list of advanced questions, is Tzadik Viralo, why do the righteous suffer? That would be a really hard question. But the mm -hmm. second hardest question is, who has the legitimate role to interpret the, uh, the oral Torah, uh, which for our purposes, let's say, is the ambiguities present in the written Torah? Right. Yeah, it seems to me that this is it starts to be the central question. I don't know when these parties start to arise. I mean, you've have, you have the Maccabees start to come in uh, during the Hellenistic period. So the Hellenistic period comes and Jews are starting to compromise the, the covenant with the Hellenists because they think Hellenism is so fashionable and they want to do all these, you know, gymnasiums and all this stuff. And they would start to compromise the religion causes a reaction in the, in the Maccabees uh, the Greek Maccabees, Catholics are certainly familiar with the Maccabees, um, which produces the Hasmonean dynasty. And then there's these different parties, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians, the Alexandrian Hellenists. Mm -hmm. uh, would you say that this is the central question among them is who has the authority to determine this? Is that the central question that hinges on all these parties? I think that would be a, a fair thing to say, definitely. Okay. And I would like to also say, state that... Um, you know, it is definitely easier for us to place the, the historical locus of these questions in the Hellenistic period. That's perhaps when they're most available to us, but that's primarily why they're most available to us in the historical record. Uh, this is when you begin to have, you know, some external documents besides the, uh, the fairly limited written tradition. You begin to have the, uh, the uh, documents which would later make up the Apocrypha. You have... Uh, non-Jewish documents that are looking at Jewish society to some degree. We begin to have multiple perspectives. And so I think the question is much more basic and goes back much earlier, but the period when we can really begin to flesh it out and explore it and see what different people thought definitely arises with Hellenism. Hellenism yeah. provides the most direct channel of opposition to the narrow, let's say, prophetic vision of Judaism by offering, it's not really the right term to use, but let's say a secular option by offering the opportunity of a fairly um, insular people viewing themselves as having a unique covenant, a chosen status to say, hey, wait a second, look at all this kind of like uh, general global perspective that we could have. And uh, that really busts open Pandora's box for this tiny Middle Eastern people. Yes, absolutely. So the, the Maccabees take control and I'm and they revolt and they cleanse the temple. And one of the most fascinating things about that story is to me in the book of first Maccabees, mm -hmm. uh, chapter four, which is where it says this, and I quote, they're they're trying to cleanse this this profaned altar from the Greeks who had profaned it and the Jews who had compromised. And there's this, this verse uh, 445, it says this, and a good counsel came into their minds, the Maccabees to pull it down, pull down this altar, lest it should be reproached to them because the Gentiles had defiled it. So they threw it down and they laid up the stones of the Mount of the temple in a convenient place. And then here's the key part is that they say till there should come a prophet and give answer concerned to them. So it seems like the Maccabees are asking or they're waiting for some kind of authority, some kind of divine authority to make a judgment concerning this gray matter in they don't know what to do here, you know. So I, I've, what is the perspective of 
the rabbinic Jews on this. I, I know that uh, I'm not sure Maccabees how that's um, viewed really as just apocrypha or not. But is there a concept of waiting for a divine prophet in this period or in the Talmud? Wow, you're, you're asking so many great questions. Uh, can I start with a little joke? <laughs> Certainly. It, it'll be illustrative for much of our discussion. And I, I suspect that much of your audience may never have heard this joke, which is, you know, my favorite kind of audience to speak to, because I only know about six or seven jokes and I keep recycling them. So this is the famous joke of the Jew who was stranded on a Pacific deserted island. You heard this joke? No, I haven't. Please continue. Oh, hello. There you go. So please <laughs> This Jew is stranded on this deserted island somewhere in the Pacific, and he lives there for many years. And uh, finally, he manages to, single, to, to signal to a passing ocean liner, and they send out a dinghy to rescue him. And before he, he says goodbye to his island where he's lived for so many years, he, he gives the captain a tour of the uh, small you know, home he's made for himself alone in this island. And he says, and this is my summer house, and this is my house during the monsoon season. And uh, this is my synagogue. And this is my other synagogue. And the captain says, two synagogues? What do you need two synagogues for? And the Jewish man says, well, this is the synagogue that I pray in. And this is the synagogue that I wouldn't be caught dead in. <laughs> so this is a, it's a well-known joke among Jews that, you know, uh, dissension, dispute, disagreement, uh, what's called in Hebrew machloket, which means a uh, division of opinion, that's central to the Jewish condition. And the, uh, the period that you're describing of the Maccabees is especially acute because the, uh, the experience of Hellenism was overwhelming to Jews. And in fact, in, in Maccabees, there's some euphemistic language there. They refer to Gentiles and so on. But really, it was a civil war. It was a war between those Hellenizing elements among the Jews who, uh, you know, wanted to kind of immerse Jewish culture into the much larger world of Hellenism with its rationalism, with its philosophy and so on, and its sciences and literature and so on. And then there's the traditionalists who said, wait a second, this culture is totally alien to our Middle Eastern culture. And I imagine we'll explore some of the ways in which it is alien um, shortly. So the, uh, the, 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 the two poles, the oscillation of the Jewish community between, you know, attracted to the powerful culture of Elas and the much more insular, but equally, if not much more powerful culture of Jerusalem is a tension that ultimately erupted in a civil war. But the civil war of the Maccabean revolt never really ended. We are still fighting that same civil war, still deciding between these two synagogues in the desert island, for example, trying to figure out exactly where on the spectrum of an engagement with the world or isolation with the world is appropriate for um, a Jewish religious posture. So with regard, the passage that you quoted from the one Maccabees, and, and by the way, uh, to answer your second question in this context, the rabbinic tradition has largely ignored the book of Maccabees. It, um, it didn't make the cut for the Tanakh, for the Hebrew scriptures, hence it was relegated and thank God preserved by the Catholic tradition because it's such a rip-roaring book, especially the first chapter, which is considered to be the most historically accurate and most likely written by someone who is actually a combatant in the wars. So it, it's preserved a phenomenal amount of, of material uh, from a historical perspective. Uh, but the rabbinic tradition always felt kind of uh, hesitant to completely embrace the, uh, the Maccabees primarily because of the way their successor dynasties, the Hashmonaim, uh, treated the rabbinic tradition. The arrogation of both the high priesthood and the kingship to one person was considered a betrayal of rabbinic values or pharisaic values. Uh, the, um, uh, you know, some of their precipitous actions like the forced conversion of the Idumeans. Uh, and of course, as you go later on in the period, there's open hostility between the Hashmonaim and the rabbis. So they get very, very little play in the rabbinic tradition. In fact, 
while the holiday of Hanukkah is, of course, you know, widely celebrated by Jews, um, and uh, among less observant Jews, it tends to be much more popular because it coincides with Christmas, which is more or less, which is a huge holiday in the West, obviously. I don't think I need to tell you that, uh, you know, uh, the rabbinic version of it really focuses the whole thing down to one particular kind of uh, miraculous event that barely receives any attention in literature. But the rabbi said, this is the part that we can hold on to. Let's, let's really amplify that. The, uh, the war, the forced conversions, some of the savagery of the period, they, were, they felt very ambiguous about, especially when they viewed it backwards in time. Um, so let's just return to that last uh, pasuk, that verse that you cited. Um, the seeking of a prophet to sort of determine what we should do, that is, I think, a very clear um, distinction between the culture of Hellas, of Athens, which relies heavily on the human intellect, uh, the power of reason, the power of logic, and Jerusalem, which is so much more based on revelation, on a, a humility with regards to the limits of human intelligence and uh, failing of saying, you know, we, we think we know what we should do, but we need a sign, we need a prophet, we need a holy man to tell us what to do. That's really the cult, the the Kulturkampf, the culture clash that is embedded in that Pasuk that you've so uh, artfully drawn out from First Maccabees. Well, that was a really long answer. Ooh. Well, that, that's great. I, I, and that'll bring up more questions once we get to the destruction of the temple. And I, it makes me think of the Septuagint, which is at this time, around this time, or third century BCE or so, uh, translated. And the legend of Aristeus sort of seems to claim that there is some kind of divine power uh, because it states that uh, there were 70 rabbis in Alexandria. They all translated the Tanakh all, and they were all exactly the same, indicating at least that there was a widespread belief that there was some kind of divine uh, intervention here to make a, you know, the Greek Septuagint. So um, is, can you elaborate on the Alexandrian community? Are they, are they trying to assert sort of a, a Hellenized synthesis here with, with an assertion of divine intervention? Absolutely. I'm so glad you mentioned the letter uh, with the uh, story of the 70 rabbis, because it reminds me of a great little joke that uh, a famous 20th century Rosh Yeshiva said. And I hope you don't mind if I... <laughs> Certainly. Go right ahead. It's very much with the, uh, the two synagogues on the desert island, too. So the story goes, as you, as you uh, paraphrased, they took 70 rabbis and they put them in 70 rooms with the Hebrew text of the Tanakh and they had them all translate independently and they came out and amazingly, miraculously, they all had the same identical translation, including some of the diversions and obfuscations and things like that that are present in the Septuagint. So Rav Yitzchak Kutner, who's a very important uh, head of a rabbinical seminary here in New York, he said, you call that a miracle? That's not a miracle. Take 70 rabbis, put them together in one room, see if they come up with one translation. That would be a miracle. So it fits also with the synagogue aspect of it. But if we uh, historically go back to Alexandria, not surprising, of course, this was like a tremendously important center of Hellenistic Judaism. That is that you know, as I mentioned earlier, the, the Maccabean revolt never really ended, right? This is a dispute that continues right up until the 21st century, exactly where in the spectrum should Jews locate themselves. And Alexandria clearly oriented themselves further to the Greek way of thinking about how to interact with the world and interact with God. We should note, though, of course, that this is a, it's really a religious posture. They are sharing the overall goal of trying to get closer to God and fulfilling God's will in this world, but they have a serious difference of opinion as to what God expects them to do. And the, the, the way that the Alexandrian Jews expressed it, certainly the, the greatest expression, this long-lasting expression, is the Septuagint, which is an attempt to relay to the Hellenistic world that hey, Jerusalem has this phenomenal thing that you should check out. This is the Tanakh. Now, there are a lot of interesting discussions in the rabbinic tradition as to uh, 
uh, why they translated it, why they felt it was appropriate to offer this to the rest of the world. Uh, there's a question of, of coercion from uh, Ptolemy, the king, uh, and there's a lot of discussion about those uh, deviated verses where they, the Septuagint clearly goes astray from what the plain meaning of the Hebrew text is. Uh, but this is an attempt to, to kind of chip in and say, yes, uh, we've got a great culture too, and, and we'd like to contribute to the wealth of world civilization with uh, Tanakh and with our view of the world. Now, this is, I didn't give you this question, but this is an easy one. So um, how many Jews in the diaspora outside Ju the Proven Roman province of Judea are, are able to read the Septuagint? Are, are they quite Hellenized in terms of at least language, speaking Greek, reading Greek? So it's not an easy question, actually. Oh, okay. Thought that'd be but, easy. Sorry. Um, <laughs> but I think you know, answering just sort of like uh, on the back of the envelope, uh, it would appear that um, you know one of the characteristics of Jewish civilization is that it is uh, polyglottic or polyglottal. I'm not sure if that's the right word. It, it, it's common for Jews with the strange exception of American Jews that historically Jews have been well known for, you know, valuing the study of multiple languages. Um, when you look at passages in the Talmud, it's very clear that there is a heavily reliance on Greek as a language. And so that tends to lend credence to the notion that Greek was widely understood, at least as a spoken language. Uh, the problem is that almost all the speakers in the Talmud tend to be the intellectual elite. So what we don't really know is how deeply does that awareness of Greek extend. And furthermore, we don't know if, you know, they're really engaging in Greek on a high level such that they could read the Tanakh in Greek and understand it fully. But um, I think it would be safe to assume that uh, Greek would be widely known, at least in the Western diaspora. Um, actually, maybe I take that back. I think uh, Greek would probably well be well known even in the Babylonian diaspora at this time, because the passages I'm thinking of off the top of my head are from Babylonian rabbis. So Greek had a, a deep reach, at least into the intellectual community. And I think we could fairly state that there is a wide familiarity with it in the larger population as well. They probably would not read it for pleasure, more likely for business, uh, communication in the market, things like that, international trade, um, but uh, not impossible that they would have read more widely as well. Interesting. Okay. So now you mentioned the, so we've talked about sort of the Alexandrian party, talked about the Pharisees a little bit and the Hasmoneans. What about the Sadducees? Now they have a different sort of oral Torah because they don't accept the whole Tanakh. Can you tell us about the Sadducees regarding these questions? Sure. Uh, the origins of the Sadducees are actually a matter of significant historical debate, uh, but it seems that this is a group of individuals uh, who tended to be aligned with the priestly families, a certain number of priestly families in particular, and uh, they, um, they represent a certain socioeconomic class in first century, second century Judaism, first century before the common era and first century of the common era, for example. Uh, they align themselves very heavily with Roman power and uh, they tend to be an urban group. In terms of the actually what they believe, we do not have any significant writings from them that, that would give us any indication of that. What we have are their reflections in rabbinic literature uh, in Dead Sea Scrolls. And um, so to, uh, to a large extent, we don't know how they would have put things themselves, but we know how the arguments went as perceived by the rabbis. Quite often you'll have in the Talmud, for example, a, a, a particular story that begins with the phrase, Hahutz duke amar, this particular Sadducean said to Rabbi X or Y, and he'll challenge the interpretation of a particular verse of the Torah, and then the rabbi will come back with an amazingly clever answer, which will be recorded for posterity in the Talmud. But we don't know when the Tzedukim, when the Sadducees stumped the rabbis, for example. We don't have any of those records. Um, we also have in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are very valuable because it gives us this kind of triangulation ability to say, okay, we know what the rabbis thought, and they were clearly, you know, 
opposed to the Sadducees. Um, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls with possibly the Essenes, different communities, we're not exactly sure who they are. They give us a non-rabbinic, but still Jewish first century approach. And they regarded them even worse than the rabbis. Um, the tractate that I happen to be studying right now deals with the holiday of Yom Kippur, which was, of course, the pinnacle of the temple service. And it's fascinating to note the subtle negotiations that go on between the Sadducees, who largely control the high priesthood, uh, and the rabbis, the Pharisees, who uh, definitely have popular support and are generally acknowledged to know the oral tradition better. So even though the Sadducees are, like to give you one example, there's a famous passage where um, one particular uh, high priest goes in and performs a particular service. And when he comes out, his father says to him, why did you do it like that? Aren't, uh, you know, aren't you worried? Didn't aren't you worried about what the rabbis say, the Pharisees say? And he says, ah, don't worry about it. You know, the rabbis have their own thing. We're, we're Sadducees. And then he ends up being killed, right? So there's still this kind of concern that maybe the Pharisees really do know this well. And the Sadducees are, even though they have the physical power, the temporal power, they're worried about the Pharisaic opinion. Okay. I hope I'm not answering like with too much uh, detail. No, this is, no, this is great. Uh, this is great. Um, so then we have the entrance of another party, uh, the Herodians. So here it is. Some say it converted the um, uh, Egemean, um, and he now he starts to rebuild or build more on to the second temple. Uh, <coughs> are the Herodians trying to, or is Herod? trying to make himself the Messiah? Do the Herodians believe he's the Messiah? Do we know anything much about the Herodians? So uh, when you sent me your questions in advance, I actually had to look up the Herodians, which tells you how important they are in the rabbinic tradition. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we, we don't, don't hit a lot of, but so it seems to me it's more of a concern because of the appearance of a, a reference to a group of people called Herodians in uh, the Christian scriptures. Uh, from the Jewish standpoint though, um, Herod is also viewed, and when I say from Jewish, I'd say from a rabbinic standpoint, there is even more hesitancy to embrace Herod as there is to embrace the Maccabees, especially the later Hashmonaim. Um, Herod, um, you know, although he was a phenomenal, I can say two big things about Herod from the rabbinic perspective. The first is that he was a glorious builder. I mean, his phenomenal renovations of the temple, uh, the, the building of port cities of Herodia and the palace at Masada, you know, these are lasting arch architectural treasures, which are still available in Israel. Um, and, um, you know, they're valued. But he was a maniac. He was a tyrant. He murdered most of his own family. The Talmud has some bizarre descriptions of, you know, his, his insanity towards the end of his life when he he murdered his most beloved wife, and then he felt badly about it, so he preserved her body in a vat of honey. You know, there's like really bizarre, spooky things. And the rabbis do not regard Herod in any positive light as a result of this ambiguous legacy. So the, the party of the Herodians is simply a non-entity, as far as I'm aware, in the rabbinic tradition. It is becomes relevant, I think, towards the uh, you know reading of the Christian scriptures, but in the rabbinic tradition, Herod is kind of like a, you know a, a big collective hold our nose and wait until this is over. Thank you for renovating the temple; that was nice, but please let's get a more normal king at this point. Right. So uh, now we get to Philo, and this is sort of the. I'm not sure if the term logos was really popularized before this, but he seems to be the first Jew who really starts talking about logos. And he has all these terms, logos, son of God, and it's all contemporaneous with Jesus of Nazareth. Mm -hmm. um, so, and you've mentioned in your lectures that he doesn't seem to know Hebrew. Um, well, he doesn't because know he's, very well. He probably has a, some familiarity with it, yeah. but not deeply read to be sure. So, um, Sorry, I cut you off there. Oh, no, I, I was just realizing that I had already asked you some of this question. So is is Philo, so you said he's ignored, so it's difficult to really know what uh, is going on in terms of the rabbinic tradition with Philo. Um, but he does introduce this um, 
this uh, term logos as a as an interpretive key of, of the Tanakh. Um, do you do you know why he would not appear more in the rabbinic tradition or in Josephus? It just seems strange to me. No, it sounds a, it's a great question. Um, <clears throat> I've never really thought about why he would not appear in Josephus. Um, uh, I, you know, I'd have to probably go back to antiquities to see what, what would suggest the reason for his um, lack of importance. It could be, and we, do we really know how widely circulated his writings were in the first century? Do we really know, like, when does he really pick up and get popular? Uh, I would hazard a guess that you know, as Christianity expands and as it reaches out, particularly in Asia Minor and in the Italian peninsula, you have a lot more Greek readers who are not familiar with Aramaic or Hebrew. And uh, Philo represents an accessible reading, or at least one of the, the rare commentaries that is available to them uh, on the Jewish scriptures. And as a result, I would suggest that his popularity is probably much more linked to the uh, availability of his ideas in Greek. Now, Jews, of course, are also accessing Greek at this time. Uh, so the question remains, why was he ignored in the rabbinic tradition? And I would suggest um, two reasons. Um, I don't think it's because specifically they regarded him as somehow prototypically Christian or anything. I think he just didn't make his way into the mainstream cycle of ideas, um, probably because he was not himself so much. Uh, um, let, let me back up a little bit. What, what are the what are kind of like the uh, the foundation blocks of the oral Torah? Um, you know, when Jews speak about the oral Torah, what exactly do they mean? So there's this uh, large tradition of teachings handed down, according to the Orthodox theology, it was handed down from Moses at Sinai uh, to his, to Joshua and to the followers. And these are all in essentially interpretations of verses in the Torah. So for example, on the holiday of Sukkot, um, the, uh, the Torah says that you're supposed to gather and you're supposed to have four distinct agricultural products with you. Three of them are named. They are the palm frond, the uh, myrtle, and the, uh, uh, what's the other one? The uh, willow. Did I say willow? The myrtle, yeah. the willow, and the palm frond. And the fourth one is a pre eitz hadar, which translates as a beautiful fruit. All right. So now the obvious question is, uh, what's a beautiful fruit? You know, some people might say apricots, other people might say mangoes. But if I walked into synagogue on the holiday of Sukkot holding a mango, people would laugh me out of there. Uh, the, we have an oral tradition that that particular phrase, an, a goodly fruit, as I think how King James translates it, uh, is specifically a, a kind of a citron called an etrog in Hebrew. It looks like a big lemon, costs like 80 to $200, sometimes even more. It's really expensive. So um, that's, that's an oral tradition that explains an ambiguity in the text. We've got so many of these oral traditions that clarify not only behavior, like which fruit do you bring to synagogue, but also um, philosophical ideas and the nature of the soul and the nature of the afterlife and all kinds of amazing materials like this. These are generally collected into um, what were later called midrashic collections. Um, and uh, they, they're assembled essentially from the Hellenistic period right up until about the seventh century, we have these collections being put together. Uh, the legal ones were um, put in a document called the Mishnah in particular, that's about the year 200 of the Common Era, and that becomes the basis of the Talmud, which is at its root a discussion of the Mishnah, which is essentially a collection of the legal teachings of the oral tradition. So getting back to Philo, he's not soaked in these building blocks of the Jewish tradition. He's reading the Tanakh, and he is reading it with a very Greek approach, 
and he will occasionally have some of these midrashim come in to explain things, but by and large, he's adopting a, a, a hermeneutic of using analogies and using similes and a whole logical system that for the most part does not participate in the essential vocabulary of the rabbinic tradition. So therefore he's writing something very creative and quite fascinating. Uh, and uh, I think many rabbis would find it valuable for insight, but they're saying, you know, where does this idea come from? What's the authenticity of your approach? Uh, did you just make this up? Did you, because logic itself is not uh, a, a sufficiently valid reason to uh, justify a particular reading of a text. You need a tradition, you need uh, someone who validated it in an earlier generation and so on. So I think the reason why Philo is largely ignored is because he's not swimming in the same stream. You know, he may be going to the ocean, but he's not swimming in the same stream. Sorry for that strange analogy. Maybe it's oh, the that, that's great. Um, desert island thing that's still in my head. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, it seems to me to be at least a, a reasonable explanation, at least once the Christians start to use Philo and use these terms, mm -hmm. um, it, it makes sense that the division would be more acute later. But before we get into the Christian controversy, I wanted to ask you about Aquila's translation, because that's an interesting Greek translation. I mm -hmm. believe Aquila is the disciple of uh, Rabbi Akiba. Correct. Um, okay, so is do, you, do we know anything about Aquila's translation? Are they trying to create uh, more purified Jewish Hellenism from the Septuagint. What's going on here with the Aquila? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And by the way, in the uh, in the the Pharisaic tradition, he's pr it's pronounced Aquila with a hard K. Okay. You know, okay. They do it with a Q U. I trans I tolerate all pronunciations. Okay, good. Uh, but there there's definitely uh, from the there there's um, a couple of really important translations of the Hebrew scriptures, and in particular the first five books of Moses that are authored in the first few centuries of the common era. And this is a reflection of the, um, the shifting linguistic familiarity of the bulk of the Jewish population who are in the first century primarily speaking Aramaic as a vernacular uh, with significant familiarity in Hebrew, particularly in Israel. But as they move, as the center of the population moves toward Mesopotamia, Aramaic becomes even more important. And in the Western diaspora, uh, much more of Greek and later Latin. So uh, there are two major translations that are especially significant. The first one is the translation of one Unculus, uh, who is, um, the, his specific biography is still up to significant debate, but it's largely believed that he is a late first, perhaps early second century convert to Judaism uh, apparently from Roman nobility. They're not entirely clear, you know, where he comes from. Sometimes you'll see biographies that may apply him to a particular family, but at any rate, he translated the Hebrew Bible into Aramaic, and this received the imprimatur of the rabbis, uh, meaning that for Jews who are unable to access the Hebrew text or who are, much more importantly, lacking in the rabbinic interpretation of that Hebrew text, this translation is valid and approved, meaning it fits with the rabbinic interpretation. Uh, just off the top of my head to give you one uh, example of why that's important, uh, in the uh, book of Genesis, of course, with the creation, there's a reference to God breathing, breathing the, uh, uh, the spirit of life into the Adam. So what exactly does the spirit of life mean? Uh, Unkelos translates that word as ruach memalala, which means the ability to speak. That somehow the spirit of life is the power of communication. So that's clearly an interpretive addition that's not available from the simple translation of the text, but it is the, author uh, the authorized rabbinic interpretation. So when the rabbis stamped on Unkelos into Aramaic, it became the functional equivalent of canonized as a translation. And in fact, if you go to buy a Hebrew Bible today, uh, it will typically have this Aramaic first century translation and the 11th century commentary of Rashi, and that's it. Those are the three big texts, the original Hebrew text, 
Uncle's translation in Aramaic and Rashi's interpretation in France, 11th century. Aquilas represents a very different um, linguistic family because he's working towards the, the Western diaspora. And recall that after the destruction of the temple, there is, you know, tens of thousands of Jews, according to Josephus, are, are taken in slave ships to Rome, where there's already a Jewish community. Um, and there is increasing um, dispersion of Jews, especially after the Bar Kokhba revolt of the 130s. And so there are Jews living in the diaspora with less connection to the traditional Hebrew environment and even less to the Aramaic environment. So Achilles attempts to do the same thing as Unculus did, but his particular approach is to try to literally preserve not only the sense of the text, but the syntax and the word order and the literal rendition of word for word so that you can read it in Greek and it sounds terrible. It's right. like, nobody wants to translate like this, but if you really, it's kind of like away from the Greek world into the Hebrew world. Because if you really want to learn something about the tradition, then you take Achilles's translation and you can say, okay, this word means this in Hebrew. And it's a, it's a window into ju the traditional Judaism, as opposed to the Septuagint, which is more of like a window out into the Greek world. Okay. By, by comparison, by the way, I'm sorry, I, I, I just oh, stop me if I talk hey, no, go ahead. <laughs> in the uh, 18th century, and I'm, we might get to the 18th century in our discussion today, but there's a fascinating figure named Moses Mendelssohn, who was something of a child prodigy and um, in, in very much in tune with the same debate we're having right now, um, he translated the Hebrew Bible into high German written in Hebrew characters. Wow. And uh, <laughs> rabbis in Eastern Europe burned the Bible that was translated by Moses Mendelssohn. And one of the main reasons why they burned it, and here is he's a completely observant Jew, you know, observed the Sabbath and kept kosher and so on. But by translating Hebrew into German with Hebrew characters, it's not that translations were forbidden, not at all, but it was essentially saying, oh, here is a way for you to learn high German uh, when you have no background whatsoever. And he used the Torah as, a, as it were, as a text that Jews were familiar with, to allow that door to open for a traditional community. And so many of the more extreme rabbis said, this is, you know, intolerable. It was not written with the appropriate intent. And therefore, even though it has the word of God in it, uh, it should be burned as a mitzvah, as a positive act. Okay. That's also, I think, a reflection of the, the great conflict that we were seeing in the Maccabean era all the way up in the 18th century. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the, the big moment for Jews and Christians that has massive ramifications regarding Hellenism is this uh, according to the book of Acts, Kepha, Yaakov, and Shaul, that's Peter, James, and uh, Paul, uh, for viewers, uh, they claim the authority that Yeshua of Nazareth is Ben Yosef and Ben David, the Messiah, and then they claim that his authority allows them to adjudicate this whole question, essentially, that they, you know, Jews have been dealing with, and it's based on this prophecy from Amos, which says that uh, Adonai will resurrect, will restore the sukkah of David, the, the um, tabernacle, which uh, immediately comes to mind this prophecy from Noah, where Yefet and Shem will dwell in the same tent, which sort of seems to imply that what the these Jews are doing, claiming the authority of Yeshua. Um, so I think this is a, a fascinating point to, to raise. I'm wondering... Do, does the Talmud have any interpretation of these uh, and, and sort of the method that they're saying there is this divine intervention? It's Yeshua as Ben David. We have the authority to do this. What is the Jewish uh, take on that? Okay, good question. And by the way, I, I, I'm really impressed with your audience. If they follow all this, I mean, my gosh, the, your, your erudition with these questions. You don't mention, for example, that Yefet is associated with Greece in the, uh, the rabbinic tradition. And Shem, of course, is the ancestor of the Semites. 
um, which would be involve Jews as well. You have a really amazing crowd of people who listen to this. So I didn't those, know Yefet was actually just. So is Yefet just associated with Hellas alone, or is it kind of? Uh, I probably more. more than Hellas alone, but don't forget okay. Rome is also an inheritor of Hellas. Right. But the, right. In the Jewish tradition, when it says, and this is like a great apology for the Hellenists, they say, "Oh, don't worry, Yefet will dwell in the tents of shame," which okay. means that. The, the Greeks can come visit us in our tent. We're not okay. going to visit their tent, but they can come to us and they'll be welcome and we'll talk with them. We'll have a good conversation. Um, but these are like really large. Shem also represents the Arab population and so on. They're all the various Semitic families. Um, but to get to your question, uh, I'm sorry to tell you that in my limited experience, uh, the Talmud really never goes into anywhere near that kind of detailed analysis. I think it would be more historically accurate to um, confirm that the, the entire story of Jesus um, does not get a sustained historical attention in the Talmud until hundreds of years after word thinking as I speak here. Um, and so we don't have any contemporaneous, you know, voices from Pharisees recorded in the Talmudic tradition. We definitely have kind of like reflections backwards on the growth of the Christian movement, um, some of which are, are quite poignant, and, and perhaps I'll share one of them with you um, that I find especially meaningful. Uh, but they're, they're clearly not written in the first century, they're clearly not written with uh, a view to anyone who actually interacted with uh, Christians, particularly in the first part of the, the first century. Um, so the, um, the question of, is there any validity from a Jewish perspective to the claims of uh, interpreting the, uh, the, the oral tradition located in the Christian world, it's a non-question in the Talmud. It just does not come up. Uh, but if I may, can I share with you one of those stories about Jesus that I think is, is particularly um, revealing of the rabbinic attitude towards the growth of Christianity? Yeah, sure. it, it goes without saying. Many, many viewers who are not necessarily familiar with the Talmud will know there are certainly, um, I'd say probably about a dozen or so negative stories about Jesus in the Talmud, which are, and the Talmud, you recall, it's a massive document. It's over 5,000 pages long. Right, 20 uh, volumes or something, right? Massive. 40 volumes, so I don't know. 2,000 different people are speaking in it, and um, to have the occasion, to, you know, it, it's not such a surprising thing to find, um, you know, maybe two dozen negative statements about Jesus in there. This is well within the normal level of religious polemic that you have in the third century. Um, but they are, they're not uniformly negative. So one of the ones that I think is especially fascinating is a, uh, a story that's recorded around the year 300 in Babylonia that has, you know, it, it has no real uh, solid historical ascription to the first century. And in fact, there's one key uh, fact in it that would suggest it's not referring to Jesus at all. But the story goes like this. Um, the Talmud, uh, the passage, if you want to look it up, it's in uh, Tractate Sota, page 40. And uh, you have to look it up in a modern critical edition because it was self-censored out of the older editions. Most printers refuse to include this because they might not get uh, official permission to print it in a Christian uh, printing press or Christian environment. So it's not present in pre-critical editions of the text. The text says that um, a particular rabbi named Yehoshua ben Parachia was in Egypt with his student, Jesus. And, um, you know, the commentators all say, yes, this is Jesus the Nazarene. Not all of them say this, but, you know, it's clear that's the intent. And they get invited back to Israel. There was a conflict going on. It does not appear to be a conflict that occurred in the first century, which makes it a difficult uh, ascription to the Jesus that we uh, know from the New Testament, but nevertheless, um, it's more a statement about what the rabbis thought of the birth of Christianity than about the historical reality. Uh, 
So they're on their way back to Israel and they stop in at an inn, right? A hotel. And uh, they're served with great honor. And uh, the, the teacher, Rabbi Yoshua ben Prachia, says to Jesus, his disciple, um, how pleasant is this innkeeper? And the phrase innkeeper here is in the feminine. So they've been waited upon by a woman. And the term for pleasant is in the Hebrew word na'a, which has an ambiguous kind of connotation. Maybe I should have translated it. How nice is this innkeeper? The word nice, pleasant, in Hebrew can mean either, you know, very kind and generous and so on, or very beautiful physically. It has that ambiguity. Now, according to the reading of the Talmud, uh, the Jesus responded to his teacher by saying, her eyes are too round. Meaning, again, this is in the view of the rabbis writing the story, that Jesus misinterpreted his teacher's saying, thinking he was referring to her physical attributes, and, um, and uh, he responded in kind. The rabbi was enraged, and he really flew off the handle. He uh, pulled out 400 shofars, 400 ram's horns, and he placed his disciple in temporary excommunication. Rashi says there, it's, it's obviously hyperbolic language, meaning he was really, really angry with him. And by the way, before I forget, I should mention to you that the context of this discussion is the rabbis are having a discussion about pedagogy. Um, how should a person be a teacher? And they say, um, to be a good teacher, you have to draw students close with your right hand, your stronger hand, but at the same time, you must push them away with your left hand, meaning your weaker hand, but nevertheless, you have to maintain professional distance. You can't just embrace your students and give them love bombs all the time. You have to also say, you know, recognize your place, have humility. You have to like maintain that distinction with them. Not like the rabbi said, Rabbi Yeshua ben Prachia and the way he treated Jesus. So the whole context of this discussion is criticism of the rabbi for the way he treated Jesus. Now, what ended up happening at the end of the story is that, um, you know, Jesus comes back and forgive, asks for forgiveness, says, I'm sorry, I, I didn't understand. And the, the rabbi refuses to accept his appeal uh, until finally, after this has gone on for some time, Jesus comes to Rabbi Yeshua ben Prachia and uh, Rabbi Yeshua ben Prachia, the, the text reads that he had decided, okay, the young man has had enough. I'm going to re-accept him as my disciple. But he happened to be in the middle of the Shema prayer at the time, which is forbidden to interrupt. And so he held up his hand like this, as if to say, wait. Jesus, as the story goes, once again misinterpreted that signal. And he thought it was pushing him away. And so he said, okay, that's it. I give up no more connection. And that's the birth, as the rabbis put it in that particular passage, of Christianity, how the separation came about. And what I find is, is, is fascinating and thought-provoking about it is that the rabbis expressed this with a certain amount of tristesse, meaning that it was all a matter of miscommunication. It was all a miscalculation on the part of the student and of the teacher, and it is the teacher that's at fault for being so harsh in this condition, because that attitude really drove apart these two communities. And um, that is the, the genesis of Christianity in this particular passage in the Talmud. Now, I hope I haven't offended you by, no, no, by portraying, but certainly that's certainly not. The, yeah, I've, I've heard this story before. Um, and that's a, uh, that's a very interesting um take that I haven't I didn't get that interpretation from what I read I can't remember where I read about that but that's so that's very interesting um so are is there sort of a um so you said there's a sort of a tryst s um so is there is there prominence to uh considering there's negative there's these negative tales of Jesus and then there's this tale is that pretty much pretty much it for for Jesus and Christianity in the Talmud um, or is there more? No, there, there's there, there's a fair amount more. Then I, I'm not really a specialist there. I refer you to Peter Schaefer, who's done a lot of work on this. Um, oh, yes. 
So, uh, I mean, there there's a lot of uh, toss away negative passages, right? Yeah, uh, that are part of the religious polemic. Uh, there's a few sensitive passages like this, and then I think the third category is there's lots of uh, occasional discussions with uh, people who are called minim. Um, the problem with reading the text is that there's been so much censorship of the Talmud, first from without, and then self censorship later. Um, that it's hard to know exactly what that term means. It's usually translated, a literal translation means types, and it means types of heretics. Uh, but quite often those minim are fairly clear that they are Jewish Christians. Um, but that's representing really um, late first century, early second century debates, uh, probably still happening in Israel, not likely already happening in Byzantium or in Rome or anything like that. But you will have these kind of debates. Just like I mentioned earlier, there are debates with the Sadducees. So occasionally you have debates with people who are clearly Christians. There are a few rabbis like Rabbi Abahu, for example, who was active in, in Caesarea, where there's a large Christian community, and he has more of these uh, polemical exchanges. But I think those three categories are basically it. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, so let me ask you about um, one more question about this sort of split that happens here. Um, and that's about the authority of the temple, the authority we, we talked about. The, so the Christians are claiming authority with Yeshua and David. And uh, I, something that I've always noticed in the text is that there, there is the, the shining of the glory, the overshadowing on the first on the temple. I'm sorry, it's first on the tabernacle in Exodus then on the first temple um is there any indwelling or overshadowing of the of the glory on the second temple in the talmud or is there any understanding of that part of sort of god's authority being given to the right and the the cultists of of mosaic law oh fascinating and by the way i find it so ironic that uh, here i am saying jesus and you're saying yoshua <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, but okay. Um, there is a, a significant amount of debate in the Talmud, and particularly in commentators afterwards, on what the status of the Shrina was with regard to the te Second Temple. Uh, the Talmud states that the uh, the Shrina, the divine presence of God, right? We use different terms to refer to different, not really aspects of God, but ways in which we in interact with God. So the Shekhinah is understood to mean the indwelling of God. In fact, the word Shachan in Hebrew means, uh, you know, to, to be physically here, to be um, imminent, or like the word for Shekhinah is neighborhood in Hebrew. So um, the, the understanding of the Talmud, a very famous passage, is that when the Jews were first exiled uh, in the sixth century before the Common Era to Babylon, uh, the Shrina went into exile with them. As it were, God exiled himself along with the Jewish people. And most commentators tend to view the indwelling presence of God as being associated with the bulk of the Jewish people as a, as a community. So the return, as it were, of the Shrina is correlated with the ingathering of Jews to Israel. When the majority of Jews are living in Israel, there's understanding that then the Shrina is with them at the same point. So the second temple would certainly, according to that line of argument, have the Shrina. By the way, I'm stepping a little bit outside of my regular comfort zone as a historian and into like kind of theological ideas, which is, that's why I'll start making stuff up pretty soon. The, the second uh, thing that I would like to add though, is we should understand that the you know, the nature of rabbinic thought um, allows for phenomenal degrees of uh, poetic license when it comes to issues that are not pragmatic in, in concern. Like, for example, the rabbis can debate for hours about, you know, if you scratch someone else's car by accident, how much do you have to pay? Right? They can go on and on about something because that's actual pragmatic. You have to do something about it. Uh, but when it comes to like more general philosophical ideas, you know, uh, they can tolerate a wide range of opinions 
and not feel the need to really come to a conclusion. So for example, the Talmud also says that the Shekhinah is present whenever there is peace in one's home. So if you, if you get along with your spouse and your children, the Shekhinah is present there. Uh, when there is a, a, a quorum of 10 men gathered, the Shekhinah is there. And the rabbis actually debate that. And they say, okay, even if one person is sitting and learning Torah, the Shekhinah is there as well. You know, so they, the idea of where is the Shekhinah, where is the indwelling, the, the shadow of God, so to speak, is a very flexible kind of approach to that question. Interesting. Hope I okay. answered that adequately. Yeah, I, I understand that. I read that the uh, Shekhinah is not a term that... A, appears in the Tanakh but I as I sent to you I was looking up the Hebrew um as uh kabod I don't know if I'm saying that correctly but the, the term, what was kavod. that kavod yes kavod okay right yeah I've, I've heard that now okay so kavod kavod comes in that's the term used in the Tanakh both in Exodus and in I believe it's first chronicles mm -hmm. um so is the is the Talmud and the interpretation of the Jewish tradition saying that so the the this indwelling the kavod left with the Jewish people was exiled with the Jewish people in Babylon and then came back so that's sort of the the kavod at the second temple is when the Jewish came back is that what I'm if I'm understanding you correctly you are understanding me correctly but I, I should point out that uh, since you've gone deeper into the linguistic aspect of it there's, uh, there's quite a range of uh, content in the specific words used. Like, so for example, uh, I use the word shrina, which I think would be the most precise for the phenomenon you're describing. The word kavod literally comes from the word heavy, because uh, 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 just a what is your degree of familiarity with Hebrew? Are you familiar with the trilateral root, for example? I am. Yeah, I, my my training is in Arabic, so obviously ah, okay. it seems I don't. It seems I don't know Hebrew very well, but every time I look at any Hebrew, it seems to just have you know just the same thing as Arabic, but different consonants. So I don't know how similar they really are, but yes, I'm, yeah, I'm familiar. Right. With, so just just for viewers, every, every basically every uh, Hebrew or Arab Semitic word in at least in Arabic has three consonants as a, an etymological root, which has sort of a, a fundamental meaning. And so from that fundamental meaning is extrapolated all the different verbs and nouns and all sorts of different layers of that meaning. So there's that trilateral root just for viewers to understand what that is. Yeah, so precise, continue. precisely, I, I would just, uh, I, would, I would caution there are, sometimes you will have bilateral roots as well in Hebrew. But uh, trilateral is definitely the overwhelming number. So the word kavod comes from kuf veit dalet, which means literally heavy. And it is later sort of massaged in meaning to mean significant or honor, sometimes translated as glory, right? Because it means something like we say in Latin, gravitas, right? When right. we say gravitas, it means literally something heavy, gravity. But we also, when a person has gravitas, it means they have, you know, position of authority and they have they present themselves in that way and so on so the kavod uh, of god is is the, the heaviness of god as it were is understood as the the part of god that in some way somehow rests down on this earth like the shekhinah because it, it's heavier it, it descends um, it's also related to the soul sometimes the word kavod is used to be identical with the soul so you're precisely right. Uh, I use the word shchina, which is a little more common in the theological literature. That's very interesting. So I wanted to ask you about this this text from Haggai because this is sort of the polemical text for Christians, obviously. And I'm just wondering how how do the Jews understand this text, which is the prophecy about the second temple, mm -hmm. that the glory of this new house will surpass the old. In this place, I will grant shalom. And so obviously the Christians have their understanding about that and the, the meaning of the kavod being the kavod on the Virgin Mary and, you know, the whole story, of course, but, um, so I don't how necessarily do... know the whole story, but <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm just assuming. Um, so what is the kavod understanding of this? Do you, are you aware of any uh, interpretation on this prophecy from Haggai? regarding? I, I am, I'm not off the top of my head 
uh, aware of any specific interpretation, but but just again back of the envelope kind of sketching. Typically, these kinds of passages are posited to the, uh, the the what Jews would call the first coming of the Messiah, and the dispute would be, well, who says that Jesus is the first coming of the Messiah? We're still waiting. That's the uh, a kind of a go-to response to these kinds of prophecies, which. Um, you know, I guess it's just a suggestion. I mean, it's just a uh, a difference in interpretation of the specific situation. Does this situation, which happened now, fulfill that ancient prophecy, or is it not an adequate fulfillment? And that's, I guess, where the dispute lies. Right. Of course. Not really my area of strength. Though. Yeah, I understand. Um, well, let's. Um, I wanted to get to Rambam Maimonides. Um, because he seems to be the figure, uh, because there is a Christian polemic against Judaism, against the rabbinic tradition, which basically just says that um, the Christian's understanding of receiving Jesus Christ as the Messiah, he is the Logos in a similar but different way that Philo is using it, obviously. Uh, but the Logos in terms of the Greek classical tradition, meaning the whole Logos is the divine order of, of the world um but maimonides presents this integration to us to a large extent uh in a way very much analogous to saint thomas aquinas what he does with aristotle so maimonides integrates the logos in, in the sense of the religious philosophical tradition and the christian polemic says well the jews rejected jesus so therefore they rejected logos they rejected the whole divine order then they're just sort of in chaos so it seems to me that Maimonides is the big refutation of that polemic. Uh, can you tell us about the integration of logos by Maimonides into the Jewish tradition? That's an excellent, very sophisticated question. I'm so impressed with your audience that they could follow this stuff. The, um, uh, you know, there, there, Judaism is a very large intellectual tent. And there are lots of different uh, places where people can uh, find an intellectual community there. Uh, Maimonides is regarded as the rationalist uh, beyond all other rationalists. Um, and for those who uh, take a more mystical approach, for example, they tend to criticize uh, Maimonides for his rationalism. Uh, so much so, by the way, that when Maimonides' works first appeared, uh, there was significant controversy over them. And we mentioned the burning of Moses, Maimo uh, Moses Mendelssohn. Uh, Maimonides' works were also burned in this context by the Dominicans, but clearly at the suggestion of Jews living in France saying, hey, could you please burn these books because we think they're heretical. So um, there, Maimonides is generally understood as being a uh, fairly strict follower of Aristotle. He refers to him as ha philosoph, the philosopher, meaning, you know, really the, the definite article is most important there. And uh, I think in that sense, he very much makes sense in the rationalist tradition um, through St. Thomas Aquinas and others. Um, but the, uh, we should understand that while Maimonides is an, a very important voice in the Jewish tradition, a hugely important voice, like a one thinker in a millennium kind of person, um, he's not universally accepted in the Judaic tradition. Uh, the, uh, the code of Jewish law, for example, it's called the Shulchan Aruch, which was uh, written in the 16th century, um, essentially uh, organizes all Jewish behavior um, uh, for uh, for the generations afterwards, uh, he based his thought on three main rabbis. Maimonides was only one of them. And if there was a dispute between these three medieval rabbis, Maimonides lost. And in fact, Maimonides loses most of the time. Well, I shouldn't say most of the time, a lot of the time. Uh, so he's studied nevertheless and highly valued, but it's understood that his may be a minority opinion in the uh, the actual way that Jewish law is decided. Part of the reason for that is because his critics feel that he was excessively rationalistic. Uh, to give you one example off the top of my head, um, the uh, scene in the book of Samuel, I think it's chapter 28, Samuel 1, 28, when Saul consults with the witch of Endor, and he brings back 
the uh, the deceased prophet Samuel, right? So that's a pretty bizarre passage in the Bible. And Samuel, of course, warns him and says, what are you bothering me for? You're going to be here just a couple of days anyways, right? And Saul gets the message. He's going to die in battle shortly. Um, Maimonides argues that this whole story is contrary to reason, and it can't have happened the way it says so in the Bible. It must be that the witch of Endor, you know, had a lot of smoke and mirrors and had accomplices that pretended to be the voice of Samuel raised from the dead. And Saul, in his credulity, accepted it all. And later he was killed by the Philistines. So that is definitely an interpretation of the book of Samuel that is at odds with the vast majority of rabbinic opinion, which accepts the book of Samuel at face value and says, yes, Samuel was raised from the dead. So Maimonides does represent a strong voice in the rationalistic trend of a Jewish thought, but he is, he is not, um, it, it's not like canon law, so to speak, to follow Maimonides uh, on a whole host of issues. Uh, and he was, uh, you know, and, and to contrast that with, uh, with what you said earlier about kind of the critique of Judaism in the idea of the, without logos, the, um, you know, the Jewish thought is kind of like, um, rootless and kind of like um, um, uncentered, I would say that uh, that's not the, those are not the words you used, but, um, you know, what we have to understand is that there is definitely logic in the non-rational approach to um, existence that we find in the Talmud, but many of these um, logical devices that are common in Greek thought are not present in Jewish thought, or they are, in Jewish thought, there are things that are completely um, absent in Greek thought. To give you an example, uh, one of the things that observant Jews read every single morning when they go to synagogue is a particular passage from a Rabbi Yishmoel listing 13 hermeneutic rules for reading the Bible. Uh, it's a rather, I think, surprising thing that Yes, we start our day by remembering 13 rules on how to interpret the Bible. And some of the rules are very simpler, simple, like a Calvachomer argument is a a posteriori. Uh, we have a priori arguments, very Kantian kind of words. And then we have passages like a gezera shava, which means literally a declaration of equality that says that if you have this particular word written in this context in the Torah over here, and you have the same word written in a totally different context over here, they nevertheless mean the same thing, even though they are referring to totally different contexts. And there is a fixed number of these decrees of equality. You can't make them up as you go along, and you can't take them away either. So it's kind of like a super logical hermeneutic rule. It's like, you know, when you get the game board and it says you can't go more than three times in a row. Why not? It says so right here. Sorry. Uh, and so that's a non-rational approach to the Torah. But nevertheless, it is still very systematic. It would be a mistake to think of this non-Western form of logic as being non-systematic. It certainly is systematic. Interesting. Yeah, it certainly goes into the differences between so-called Western culture, which is sort of Greco-Roman, Roman, and just the the Shemite culture in general, whether that's Arab Arabs or or Jews. Just a, a the sort of Semite approach is much different than the uh, just on a cultural. But there is that logic. What you're saying. Um, last question for you. I wanted to ask you about. Um, what Charles Muskowitz told me, and that was getting into more of the 20th century and what you already kind of alluded to earlier, um, because Muskowitz asserts that essentially there there has been that split that you referred to earlier, and he he traces this split in the modern era uh, to Shabtab, yeah, Shabtai Zvi. Shabbatai Zvi. Shabbatai Zvi. I right. always get that wrong. Thank you. Um, so he, he traces this, this figure where, uh, which he receives widespread support, but his, his is, uh, as I said in my questions sending to you, it seems to be much more of the Hellenistic Bacchic tradition, sort of a orgiastic, uh, nonsensical, um, 
movement in terms of its uh, logic or you know logos. So Muskowitz asserts that that he thinks that the the sort of the movement among Jews or the left wing quote unquote Jews uh, sort of become dominant in the modern era, whereas mm -hmm. there is the the orthodox element which is far more um, at least rational or just traditional in general. Um, do you what do you what do you uh, what's your perspective on that? If that makes sense, uh, do you see it in a similar way in terms of the modern Jewish period? So, um, if I understand his uh, take correctly, and and uh, I, I watched parts of the interview you had with him, that was uh, thank you for sending it to me. Um, I'm not sure I would uh, I would call Shabbatai Tzvi kind of like the starting point for modern denominationalism, but it definitely was a contributing factor. Um, Shabbatai Tzvi, of course, is a 17th century figure who leads a messianic movement that ends up disastrously failing as, you know, his followers expect him to, you know, start uh, the messianic era in Jerusalem. He ends up converting to Islam instead. It's hard to imagine it going much worse than that, right? So, uh, and the, and Jews around Europe are totally disenchanted and disheartened and so on. Uh, but modern denominationalism among Jews, that is the division of the Jewish body politic into competing strands, all claiming to be authentic uh, visions of traditional Judaism, that's really a, a 19th century phenomenon. So we're talking about a significant gap of time. Shabbatai Tzvi certainly committed, uh, certainly contributed to the development of antinomianism, meaning we can challenge the traditional observance, we can challenge the rabbis, we can challenge authority. A lot of the things that he did, for example, were definitely very modern in, in the sense, like, for example, he said, what do we need a Torah scroll for? Have a look at this nicely printed book that we've been developing now for about a couple hundred years, you know, we should all use books, that's modern. If we live today, he would suggest iPads, you know, why should you bother with a scroll? Get an iPad. Uh, so there's definitely kind of like that challenge to authority that's present there. Also incipient feminism, very much so in his movement. Uh, but I think it's much more historically precise to look at denominationalism in the 19th century as an attempt by some Jews, particularly in Germany, to try to achieve a kind of socio-political status by demonstrating that Jews can participate in the modern world. Once again, hearkening back to the beginning of our discussion with the Maccabees, um, the early liberal movement, which is called in America reform, um, you know, essentially wanted to demonstrate that all of these strange oriental practices of Jews um, and their costumes and things like that are not really necessary. Uh, we can dispense with that and we can be Germans of the Mosaic faith. And uh, so move, you know, like changing synagogue architecture, synagogue liturgy, removing references, for example, to uh, the anticipated redemption in Israel is something that they did in order to try and uh, demonstrate that, you know, Berlin is now our Jerusalem. Uh, it's much more of a political and a social impetus than hearkening back to Shabbat Tzvi. Nobody except the Dunme, which is a group of... Uh, in Turkey that are descendants of Shabtai Tzvi's followers actually regard him as a hero, um, as, um, you know, someone to emulate. Uh, I would say there's a big division between Shabtai Tzvi and the denominationalism of the 19th century. Interesting. Very excellent. Well, Dr. Abramson, I really appreciate your time today. Uh, any final thoughts or concluding remarks on uh, Hellenism and Judaism? Well, um, I'd just like to uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, you've been uh, quite a uh, gracious and uh, formidable interlocutor. I mean, I'm <laughs> very impressed with your range of expertise. Um, I did look up your bio. I noticed you spent some time in the view as well. We, uh, we didn't get into any of the Ukrainian connection there, but uh, oh, um, my first book was on uh, Ukraine. Yeah, I noticed that. I, I actually didn't. It was an online program, so I never actually went to Ukraine, unfortunately. But uh, I, I had contact with the with the Ukrainians, of course. So definitely. Yeah, well, thanks no, so much for your... Good. Go ahead. Sorry. I'm sorry. No, uh, so concluding thoughts. Thank you very much. I appreciate sure. speaking with you. I look forward to seeing this online. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Abramson. And we look forward to your three-volume history.
coming out uh, a little bit two another two years or is there a yeah. schedule for that okay excellent two more excellent. years for volume one wonderful wonderful well once again uh, you can take a look at dr abramson's work below at the link provided uh, so thank you very much for your time have a great day take care bye-bye <laughs>